probably went for about three or four months where just nothing was going right for me just nothing it was just oh it was just hell every day I was just you know I was just constantly messing up and burning things and taking too long or you know and um but that's where I really learnt to um to cook this is the crackling I'm Anthony Huckstep We're not all born with talent. We're not all born with opportunity. But a tenacious, never say never spirit can open up many doors and experiences. Louis Tikaram grew up in the New South Wales country town of Mullumbimby. When he turned 18, he took a chance on a gut instinct and it set him on a culinary path he'd never imagined. So Louis Tikaram. Back in Australia, <laughs> late after taking LA by storm at EP and LP, what what brought you back here and well, to Brisbane? Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's kind of, you know, people say I'm back to Australia, but I'm just as shocked. But for me, it's not really back to the area. It's not back to Australia. It's back to the area I kind of grew up. Me and my wife, um, you know, when we when I finished school in two thousand and three. The Byron area, it was no, you know, there's a few restaurants, but it was something that, you know, I never thought I'd probably find a career around, you know, when I left. And that's why I just, HSC, pen down. Were you, you going to be a chef? Or yeah, well, that was kind of, um, yeah, I I, uh, I grew up in between Mullumbimby and Fiji. So my f- <laughs> right, that's yeah. a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> so my father's Fijian, but even more of a twist, he's Fijian Chinese Indian. So his mum's Fijian Chinese and his father's Fijian Indian. Wow. So growing up in that household, you just never knew what was gonna be on the dinner table. Was it gonna be chicken chop suey and steamed fish ginger and shallot, or was it gonna be goat curry with fresh roti, or was it gonna be polusami with kakonda you know so it was always kind of different and then in fiji you know we didn't have television till 1996 so basically you would come home and that was your entertainment you didn't just veg out on the couch and scroll on the ipad and you know when you're a kid you you went and you helped cook or you helped so you were in the kitchen from an early age? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I just love to be with my grandma in the kitchen and watching her cook and watching her put together all the food and then sitting down and talking and eating and sharing and laughing and for hours, you was, know. And was then, there any dishes you can tell us about, like, cooking with your grandmother that, you know, that have been important to you? Yeah, like, definitely, like, her, you know, like a Fijian chicken curry. So Fijian cuisine... There's the traditional cuisine, but then there's what our families created through this multicultural background where it almost created like a Malaysian style curry because you had the fresh coconut cream in Fiji, but then you had the Indian influence with the dried spices. And like if you talk to a Fijian and you say, oh, like Fiji chicken curry, it's just like this star anise and cassia and curry leaves and coconut. And it's a whole kind of genre of, cooking this this kind of style of curry so that's definitely like even my wife can cook it as well you know because it's almost like a little rite of passage yeah like if you spend time in Fiji you learn this style of cuisine yeah unreal so you left Mullumbimby so after your HSC yep so while I was in um, school I yeah, I, my my main goal was and I, I, I wanted a car I love to surf I love to hang out and We went, you know, growing up, I grew up on kind of on a farm in 110 acres. So just our driveway was a three kilometer dirt road. So I'd be riding my bike everywhere and I wanted a car. And so there was a kind of rinky dink old Thai restaurant in town. And uh, I went in and I uh, I wanted and needed a job. And they said, yeah, you can wash dishes. You know, so I said, okay, great, perfect, done. And so I started washing dishes at uh, Gecko Thai. And um, did you know much about Thai food? No, nothing. Never, like never, never really. My grandfather, Indian, called it Thai, so he didn't know much about Thai food. <laughs> I'm like what? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I didn't know much about Thai, and then so 
I was washing dishes and there was just a Thai woman and one other guy that helped her in the kitchen. And one day he didn't turn up and I was washing and then I could see her just going down. And so I went to help her and she was kind of like, oh, wow, you, you know a bit about cooking? I was like, yeah, cook with my grandma a lot. And I'm like, cumin, cumin, you know, turmeric. And she's like, I think she really just saw cheap labor to be honest <laughs> she was like mm. <laughs> so then she said I'll find another person you can start to help me so straight after school I'd go make curry puffs and skewers and that's where I really started and then I was pretty much every single weekend and every night after school I would I would go and, and cook um, was that the roots I mean you ended up at like long grain well that's is, what yeah well, which is an pretty important restaurant in our culinary history that's when i kind of fell in love with thai food and even though it was like country thai i i loved it i just loved the aromas and that complexity of flavor and you know we i went out in byron one night um during year 12 i think i just turned 18 and i met a guy at the beach hotel and he was like oh you cook and now we're, i think they just finished work at finn's so that i could tell that were the you know, tattoos and they were kind of the and i was like oh and I started chatting. He's like, "Dude, if you want to, you want to cook Thai food? There's this spot in Sydney. It's just open. It's called Long Grain, and that's like, if you want to know anything about anyone or Thai food, that's where you go." So, I only had that one word in my head. Yeah. And uh, obviously, no one, in, no one, and none of my friends even knew what a restaurant or anything like that. And so that's what I did. My brother lived in. He went to Sydney Uni. HSC pens down. I bought my car, packed it with all my stuff, looked in a revision mirror. My mum's there crying. <laughs> and I said, if it doesn't work, I'll just drive back. Like, it's no biggie. Drove to Sydney, um, turned up at my brother's. He was in Chippendale and Abercrombie Street. Left my car and he said, okay, what's the plan? I'm like, I'm going to go to this spot, Long Rain, tomorrow. And apparently it's like, you know, super cool and I, I want to I wanted work there. And So there wasn't a job going. You just wanted, you wanted a job there. Yeah, I didn't. I'd, I'd never even stepped foot into a restaurant, like a good restaurant, ever. You know, like ever. So this was the whole. And my brother was like, "Great, cool, excellent." So I could. I knew I could walk there, so I, he told me how to get there, and I walked through. You know, this is when Chippendale wasn't a nice suburb. You know, so I walked through Chippendale and the Central, and then went to Surrey Hills, and turned up at this huge, beautiful glass windows. You know, and I walked in and. I still remember exactly, you know, I, it's so vivid in my memory. And I walked in and I said, hi, I'm, uh, can I talk to uh, someone about a job? And she was like, oh, do you have an appointment? Did I know you're coming? And I was like, an appointment? It's a restaurant. Like, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean, like an appointment? You know, make food. And uh, Marty came out and I could just still, he was, must have been cleaning crab and he had his tea towel over and he was like, what? And I was like, oh, I was just wondering if there's a um, possible for um, to like work here as a as a chef. And he was like, no, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, now, uh, and so I kind of just his if you know Marty, his face. I wasn't going to argue with this guy, so I was like, okay. So I left, and I, I went back to my brothers, and he said, oh, how was it? And I said, oh, didn't go kind of how I planned. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll just go back tomorrow. So I went back the next day. Pretty much exactly the same thing happened. And I went home and he asked me again. I told him and he's like, well, you know, you're not going to stay on my couch forever. So you better <laughs> sort it out. So I said, I'm going to go back tomorrow. And then I went back the next day and uh, same thing. And he just said, oh, you're a persistent little fucker, aren't you? <laughs> and then from that day on, I, he took me in and he showed me a room, which is about the same size as this kind of like five meters by three meters and there was a, a meat grinder and a coffee grinder <laughs> and it's that's all i saw for the next year so i just ground curry paste and spices every day day in day out from seven in the morning till six at night well it's aromatic if nothing else <laughs> so <laughs> so i went home the first couple of days and I woke up and my uniform wasn't at my brother's and then I kind of looked out the back into the courtyard and it was all on the courtyard out the window from the two-storey <laughs> terrace. And he's like, it stinks. It stinks of garlic and onion. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so that's what I did. So I just, I just worked at Long Rain. Marty bought me my first chef jacket, my, my knife. I didn't have anything, you know. I didn't even know you needed these things to work in a restaurant. So 
he really took me under his wing and uh yeah just I, I i put away deliveries strained all the stocks pressed the pork hock made curry paste ground spice and that, that was it that well, was that my pork life. hock was pretty significant dish you know under long grain and, and, and it's sort of celebration yeah. as a restaurant you know like how many did you do there i mean what what was involved in that dish? oh we do we well, we used to do we used to do four trays of pork hock so five times six it was 30 hocks in each tray so we braised them in a really beautiful aromatic master stock for about four hours and then we deboned the hock and then checked it for bones and then kept the skin completely intact and then pressed them in trays kind of in the vice versa so they almost like locked in yeah and then would put you know it would have been at least easily 100 kilos and then press them down for 24 hours and then pop them out and then cube them and then that was the dish yeah so and that would be four trays so you know 100 hawks every day um, seven days a week. <laughs> so was there one person on that section? <laughs> yeah, <much>. me <laughs> plus Carapes. Plus, <laughs> so it was like a real, it was a real rude awakening, you know, to to what hospitality was, and you know, if oh my god, we work with this French guy, and he if he found a bone, because then I would do all the base, you know, and then they would just come and it's all ready, and um, if he found a bone in the pork, oh, oh my god, Lord have mercy, I was in like <laughs> oh. I'd just be screamed at for so long, a because I could have damaged his knife, and b just because I was the, uh, I was the uh, punching bag of the kitchen. So long grain is uh, is interesting in your career, given that that's almost a starting point. Yeah, certainly in a big time restaurant. You left, and you you gained some serious street cred with other places. Yeah, you know, like Bentley, Tetsuya's, and then you ended up coming coming back around to long grain and yeah you know, winning young chef of the year and yeah um and running the restaurant yeah it was quite amazing it was uh you know like i i owe marty you know everything you know if it wasn't for him i just don't know how my life would have uh you know played out if he didn't accept me that day you know could i could be a completely you know could have lived a completely different life so we always kept in touch you know through all the different restaurants i worked at and then i ventured overseas and I worked in, you know, in Southamptons and Canada and travelled through Scandinavia and Europe and back down into Southeast Asia. And that whole trip was about expanding my repertoire and my horizon of, of food because I fell in love with this, with Thai cooking and I was obsessed with it. But then I didn't want to sell myself short i wanted to experience all different types of cuisine so i traveled through turkey and egypt and you know europe and spain and portugal and scandinavia and hoping that i would kind of find that kind of fire in my belly for a different cuisine as well other than asian but and i thought i did when i traveled through italy and it was like amazing and the, the you know the naples and the pizza and the cheese and you know like and then it was so cool and then i kind of traveled i went to egypt and then from egypt i got a cheap flight from cairo to bangkok and i kind of got off the plane in bangkok and just instantly that humidity and plastic furniture and grilling meats and fish sauce and some time and then i was like oh, who am i kidding this is <laughs> This is it. You know? I'm sold. I want to. <laughs> I want to go there now. Yeah. So that's when, in the end, so I and, and that's and then I flew back home after Southeast Asia, and uh, I landed in Sydney. I think it was. A, I got an early flight, and I landed, and I was staying with my auntie in Potts Point. And then I kind of like had a little nap and got up and went downstairs, out onto kind of Maclay Street, and I wanted to get a coffee. And then who do I see? First, first person. Why the fuck haven't you called me? I'm like, Marty, I just got back, literally, I just got back, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, what do you want to do? You want to get tea or something later? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. He's like, meet me at Long Grain. And so we got to Long Grain, literally just landed, and he was in a hard hat. And it was when 
the whole <laughs> muddy boats and a hard hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was, I didn't know what I was in for actually. <laughs> it sounds more like YMCA. <laughs> and that was the the renovations of of Long Rain. Yeah, ten years on, and they took over the downstairs, and they created the canteen, and and he was like, "Wow, what do you?" You know, we did a big walkthrough, and he said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Man, it's it's awesome. Like, it's great. It's like a whole another rebirthing of Long Rain. I think." It's great, and he goes, "No, what do you th- what do you think? Like, you want to run it?" So here I was, like, I built my reputation out. Like, I went Long Rain, then Bentley, then Tets, and which you know. are very different to Long Rain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you need tweezers in some of that. Yeah, you, like <laughs> like Brent Savage Tetsuya, amazing yeah. chefs, amazing cuisine. Yeah. Very big detail. Very, yeah. So I, I've always been a bit of a sucker for punishment, just chucking myself into the deep end. Um, yeah, and that's kind of how it all kind of un- unraveled, you know. And I just, when I went traveling, I kind of thought, am I going to just throw all this away? Like the, all the kind of how hard I've worked to get to these restaurants and then just chuck it away to, to go backpacking kind of thing. And I didn't know what my future was when I landed back in Sydney. I didn't know if I would have had to start again from the bottom and, and do it all again. But just like that first day I walked into Long Range, kind of six years earlier, it all. You know, it just all kind of unfolded, and when within the end of the day, I was uh, <laughs> I was running the joint, you know, and I left it as a second year apprentice, you know. So that's pretty frightening. Yeah, to, to notice this little guy tapping on the door <laughs> to running it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like this fire in your belly to sort of jump in the deep end and just you know go for it without sort of knowing what you're getting yourself into. Is that what lured you to LA? Like, yeah, is that, that sort of a challenge. Yeah, Cause, it was because. Yeah. I mean, they. I guess you got to give them an experience of Australian cuisine with Asian influences and all of your rich history that you'd built up yeah. that maybe they hadn't seen before. No, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and another that was another amazing experience of um, you know an individual just trusting me and being like, okay, if that's if that's what you want to do. Let's let's just do it. So, yeah, I, um, I, I went to LA and completely different restaurant completely different concept completely different food completely different style of service completely different flavors you know not even for the customer but also for the the cooks that were yeah. preparing the food you know like n- no server or cook or anyone had used lemongrass turmeric coriander you know like yeah. dry, which we kind of take for granted yeah, yeah. It's, for us it's on every kind of tri- streets corner and that's kind of what i explained to them i said this is this is our Mexican. So imagine, you know, every corner, everything, there's there's a little Mexican, there's something. This is what, this is our influence in Australia. It's kind of Southeast Asian. Yeah, so LA was a very, it was a, it was a, it was a really cool story, really cool, you know, and that's what I was doing. I was telling basically a story of my life, you know, the cuisine that inspired me, the place that I had worked and the places that I've travelled. Was there a dish that you couldn't take off the menu over there that some people sort of got um, that, that you kind of was important to you? Or? Yeah, like, you know, I, I think a really big one was, there was a couple. Um, one was Coconda, which is a Fijian-style ceviche with fresh-squeezed coconut cream um, and sea grapes and cherry tomatoes and it was a very it was a dish that I've probably the earliest dish I ever learned to cook with my grandmother and because of that link to Mexican cuisine you know I think that was always a good segue into the American palate and the American way of thinking if they can compare it to something that they knew they'd give it a whirl yeah so it was a Fijian ceviche you know and then I was like wow this is really cool it's like a ceviche but that richness of the coconut cream really makes it you know quite special so that was a you know that was a great dish um a, a dan dan noodle um with pork neck which was really awesome with a lot of szechuan and you know they, they knew that kind of typical chinese cuisine but then when i started delving into a little bit more complex flavors of chinese they could still understand the food and yeah. and relate to it quite well and dan dan noodles that's a 
cracking dish. It's so good. I try and make it at home and <laughs> it's not a bad version. Yeah, but yeah, like yeah. I don't do pork neck and I'll have to steal your recipe. It's yeah, no, way. it's just perfect. Yeah, like pork neck, you just dice pork neck and then just saute it and then just like work it into the Szechuan sauce and over top of the noodles. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so, you know, it's cool. Like, yeah, e- uh, EP really, um, you know, it almost changed, you know, a whole city's kind of eating habits and, you know, it didn't kick off you know, straight away, but I just kind of stuck to it and I wasn't going to move over to the other side of the world and not cook the food that I want to cook. I was happy at Long Grain, you know, I would just happily just, you know, because I was able to cook the food that I love to eat. So yeah. I wasn't going to change it and um, kind of got to a point where it was like, well, you know, it it hasn't really taken off yet, but I I I wanted to just stick to my guns, and and then finally it started to started to gain some traction, and then it really just went like gangbusters. Well, yeah, I mean, you were huge. The restaurant was huge, and that surprises me that you came back and you came to Brisbane, <laughs> <laughs> which I've got to concede, from a food point of view, it's changed dramatically in the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah, but, but what what lured you here? Like, um. My good friend uh, Jonathan Barthelmus, he uh, he's he, got Greco and he's got Greco and Yoko, Yoko which is yep. right next door. And you the know, Apollo in Sydney, Apollo yep. and Chocho, and so he's he's always been a really good friend and someone that I really trust uh, their opinion. You know, not only in food though, in restaurant scene and business as well. And uh, he came for his fortieth birthday actually and celebrated at EP. And he's originally from Burley and. Um, you know, he's like, Louie, man, like, I know you're from, you know, like, Mullumbimby and, you know, it's, Brisbane's like, it's going off. <laughs> and I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you know, you could you could possibly even, like, live around Mullum and still just, you know, commute or, you know, you know, your parents are still there. And, yeah, just it never really occurred to me that I could have the best of both worlds. I could be around the area that I grew up and around my family and also – work at a g- great restaurant so did you ever envisage doing Cantonese yes well you know it was always a it's uh you know one of my favorite foods to eat you know I feel just stemming from those kind of meals that my grandmother used to cook me and her father had one of the first Cantonese restaurants in in Fiji right the Canton Cafe in Suva on Mark Street and then together with, you know, that kind of uh, rite of passage of going to Golden Century for the first time, being a young cook in Sydney and eating, like, the live seafood and the pippies and exo. And, you know, it's a very nostalgic uh, cuisine, I think, to, to any chef that came up in Sydney. And um, Brisbane just doesn't have any, you know, just didn't have anything like it. And yeah. I always wanted to continue to grow and to develop my skills you know that's why I really love hospitality because it's an industry where we don't stop learning and growing and I always wanted to um to keep kind of expanding my repertoire and my reputation of the food that I wanted to cook I never wanted to be painted into the corner of being oh he's a he's a Southeast Asian guy he he oh we can't really have him there he just only does Southeast Asians where I wanted to make sure that you know, I'm 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 kind of expanding and uh, able to to adapt to all different types of cuisines. Yeah. Was well, so Stanley's got like lots of classic Cantonese dishes. I mean, what's your approach here? Like, are you doing modern twists? Or like, how how do you approach doing something like that? I mean, it's a huge restaurant as well. It's like, a big restaurant, and I suppose from when I got back to Brisbane, my style or my approach to the menu changed drastically because I um I don't know if it's because I was away for so long or I never cooked in Queensland but the produce is just it's still I, I just, it's like pinch yourself moments like just the seafood coming in and the the vegetables from these small asian markets and the beef and the pork coming just from a few hours away and you know getting direct with the with the farm or the or the farmer and and uh just a the 
the kind of like limited amount of hands that passes through. Yeah. You know, it's still like a like a kind of a country town in some sense of dealing with these suppliers. And so, you know, Cantonese food is such a perfect cuisine to just showcase good produce, showcase steam fish, showcase local bugs, showcase Harvey Bay scallops, Malula bar prawns. Gundawindi pork, stockyard beer, you know, it's just, it's all from around here. Yeah. And there's all these little Asian growers and I'm, I'm using these smaller guys and they're just sending me a picture of a, a plot of Gailan saying, is this the size you want it? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that yeah, that's good. And he's like, great, I'll just take, I'll take, you know, Stan will just take that plot. So the farmer's happy because he's sold the whole plot. He doesn't have to wheel and deal his guy line at the markets and things where he's just going to, you know, harvest it and send it to my guy and my guy's just going to bring it to me. So, Do you see that as a, something happening in the Brisbane, Brisbane scene or is it more Australia and that's how it's changed since you've been gone and there's more t- sort of linking to quality produce and, and connection with farmers? Yeah, like definitely. It's a, it's, I met this, I met a fisherman, Chris Bolton, you know, from, from far north Queensland and, uh, you know, he was on this seesaw where, you know, the fishing industry was going one way where it was just going big and trawling and and to, to kind of keep afloat, that was the way you had to go because, you know, this small kind of wheeling dealing wasn't really working and then he kind of said that he turned a corner and went, hey, how about if I just supplied the best quality fish that I can possibly supply just to just a few people not on that large scale and he just couldn't believe it saved his whole business family and whole career because that and then it just took off you know and it was like and now i just get i get fish sent directly you know from him exactly the way he's packed the box and and it's it's uh it's it's still like a pinch yourself moment when you eat that coral trout it's like something that I'd never tasted before in my life like the the, uh, the amount of care and and the, the amazing thing in brisbane people they're buying it you know and i think like brisbane clientele are so patriotic that if it's a local farmer or a local fisherman uh, you know they're willing to pay you know and they know i'm not getting it for cheap and then they're not getting it for cheap either but they're supporting the local kind of industry which is pretty amazing so like Brisbane's just been a whole uh, bunch of surprises so far. Hey, you sure. sound like an apprentice, like you just started cooking again. You're like full of like, oh, like it's just, eyes wide open. Yeah, it's like, it's amazing. What is it about working in this industry that you know that you love? Like, um, I just you know like I I know it sounds kind of corny, but just like doing what you love, you know, every day. It's it's just uh, I feel you know often I just feel very selfish because there's not a lot of people that you know really truly you know so passionate and then love what they do every day and you know get off on kind of ingredients that they're cooking or a customer's reaction or 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 you know just how grateful people are for for good food and you know really uh kind of appreciate it a lot for doing this Uh, it sounds like you've had a pretty stellar career and you have and a lot of drive behind it, but there's got to be some pretty me- big mess ups along the way, <laughs> like where you've uh, been yelled at at head chefs and stuff like that. Like, have you ever ruined a service, or you got some funny stories behind that? Probably, it was probably when I went to Bentley, <laughs> <laughs> and you could probably imagine <laughs> a guy that just rolled in off the street from Mullumbimby, no training, no nothing, only knew lemongrass and lime leaf, only knew how to cut angel hair as fine as possible, then going to a kind of under a chef like like Brent Savage, who's yeah. got a quite a already a um quite unique style of cooking and to go into a team of four guys, lunch and dinner, you know, doubles every day. And, um, you know, four people in the kitchen cooking, you know, degustation. There's not much room for for training wheels. Right. And that kitchen was tiny. The kitchen like the was tiny. the original Bentley. And I kind of told him a porcupine as well. I told him I was a fully qualified chef when I'd only been cooking for two years. 
<laughs> so I knew like he didn't want to um, – I knew that he didn't really want to hire, you know, any apprentices. I think he was just looking for, like, the real deal, you know. There was Dan Hong, Dave Vahul, um, myself, and Brent, you know. So it was already a bit of um, – there was a bit of talent in the kitchen already. And so I just told him, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm qualified. I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, ready to roll whenever you need me. And he used to come into Long Grain a lot, and that's how we met. So when he opened Bentley, he um, <clears throat> he said, oh, if you want a job, come up. And I said, okay. But I was still kind of uh, tied into a uh, a, a, a um, hospitality placement kind of apprenticeship <laughs> thing. So I just kind of like winged it. I went and I started and I was kind of cooking and um, – yeah, one day the 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 woman walked into the uh, to the restaurant and she said, oh, "I just wasn't looking for you at Long Grain, but they told me you didn't work there anymore." <laughs> <laughs> and all I heard was "Louis," <laughs> and I went out. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, <laughs> why are you? But then you know, like Brent said, no, he's working as you know, he's fulfilling all his duties as a you know as a fully qualified chef. So I got signed off, you know, of my apprenticeship. So what's he like to work for? Because he's such a nice guy. Oh, is he is he a oh. brute in the kitchen? Those those days, yeah. So I was, you know, obviously I was way over my head, you know, and um it just it we probably went for about three or four months where just nothing was going right for me. Just nothing. It was just Oh, it was just hell every day. I was just, you know, I was just constantly messing up and burning things and taking too long or, you know, and, um, but that's where I really learned to, um, to cook. You know, that's where I really, you know, it was just, you know, there's so much responsibility on you and so much pressure. And that's where I really turned a corner in being able to, to, to stay composed and to just push through and to, really um i suppose that kind of satisfaction as well from from kind of growing and learning and and uh and then finally mastering a a technique or a section because yeah brent was you know, he was it was quite hard you know and he had a lot of pressure on him as well you know it was like we opened up we got two hats we got best new restaurant you know it was it was a lot you know so he was kind of under the microscope and it just showed me that that passion and that drive that Brent had as well that really to kind of blow all expectations out of the water by just keeping your head down and just working and and letting that passion kind of speak for itself you don't have to you know come in guns blazing and and being you can let your food do the talking and that's really like what Brent did in those early days of of Bentley, which was really cool, but has there been a moment when you realised, yeah, I, I'm good at this? Well, that's kind of yeah. When I when I that that's a that's a funny thing you say that because that was I wasn't you know I wasn't uh, I wasn't the best at school and I I didn't you know there wasn't much I was kind of good at or there wasn't a very clear. Uh, outcome for for when I was in those late teens and I think my parents might have been a little bit worried but you know they've always stuck by me but then when I started cooking I was like oh wow I think yeah this is I think this is something I can do because I I enjoy it I love it um, I'm good at it and I think that's when I think at long reign when Marty started just piling more and more kind of pressure on me when I was only about 19 like he took me to long uh to Melbourne to open up long grain Melbourne instead of like all the different head chefs and sous chefs he took me um and that's when I really learned and he and he kind of said you I I, I'm taking you because I trust your palate you know so when I'm doing other things you can make sure that things are tasting you know correctly and that was from him kind of making nam gins from scratch and and balancing these flavors that you would never normally think would possibly become a kind of a harmonious flavor you know straight lime juice straight fish sauce coriander roots chili and palm tree how do how do you make that taste good it's just these five like crazy ingredients you know absolutely and but they're wild together when yeah. it's when it's when right. it's right yeah when it's right so that's kind of he honed the, those skills into me at quite a young age. And now um, I really enjoy 
teaching that to younger to younger guys as well, like letting them finally balance and, and train their palate to pick up on different flavours. Cool. Can we go down into the kitchen? Have a look at yeah, what you do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd love yeah, to uh, see, see you in action. And maybe <laughs> eat some food too. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. This is the crackling. So how do you feel like when you get in the kitchen? Like, How does it make you feel working as a chef? Well, I really, yeah, it's like, you know, some people... Like, oh, how do you do, you know, like, it's long hours or it's, you know, it's hard. But to be honest, I love, it's kind of funny, I love to be here, the, f- the first person as well. I just enjoy the kind of serenity of the kitchen and getting a coffee. And yeah. it's pretty amazing here. It h- puts a whole nother spin on it well, at Stanley. because And also, to be fair, it's a pretty good kitchen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got the Brisbane River just You've got there. the river at the front. I can have a coffee there and just have a thing that's come in and it's all green marble and brass. And yeah, and it, it almost, honestly, it feels like a, a sense of achievement every time I come in here where it's like, wow, look at, look at this environment. I've, you know, really, I feel like I've earned to work here and I've earned to, to kind of have this as a, a place that I call my kitchen. So yeah, it's every, every day it's uh it's like a, a reward I suppose when I come into the kitchen and then to have you know to be able to train guys and to to teach them like I said before like some a skill set that they will you know take for them for, for the rest of their career just as I was taught yeah. and the the possibilities are, are limitless for them you know so it's cool to see people just at the start of their kind of amazing journey that, that totally and got. you've been talking about the influence of Marty Birds and Brent Savage you know of all these different things you've done in your career but now you're the mentor yeah yeah, yeah. so it's kind of cool the the, uh, the apprentice becoming the master yeah I think but everyone cool. it is a bit cool I mean you guys are wearing jeans these <laughs> days like how was it back in the day when you were an apprentice what were it you was, wearing then it was very different you know like Marty it was and that's where I really learned to be very particular you know working for Marty and it wasn't only in the food for in a sense it was i was with the dustpan of brew you know dusting the cigarette butts from around the trees on the street or or making sure the glass was clean so it was quite amazing i only ever worked for chef owners brent tetsuya marty when sam nick you know so this kind of uh sense of pride inside and outside of the kitchen was you know was huge for me and making sure that staff were well looked after the restaurant and equipment and you know everything was really well looked after and it's something that I'm trying to kind of instill into these young young cooks as well that you know people are looking for the the whole package when they're looking for for a chef for sure so Pork is pretty integral in uh, Cantonese cuisine. There's yeah. Some classic dishes, and you're doing some classics here. Yeah, yeah. So can, can we run through, like, the crispy pork belly? Yeah, so like this is a dish that, you know, it's it was kind of... My grandma used to cook it a, a lot. Um, my grand-grandfather was a, it was a very... Uh, suyuk was a very uh, important part, because the pork in Fiji is is very good. Like, it's, it's very, really, really beautiful pork. There's wild boar as well, but plus the... The um, the pork is uh, very very nice. I think it's the humidity. It's my kind of. Yeah. Uh, you so know, does that make take. you fussy with the sort of producer that you use here and like the sort of pork that you're looking for? Yeah, well, I really like the, you know the pork in Fiji. It's very subtle. Um, I think which is a, a massive, uh, you know, kind of must when I think when you're roasting soup because it's it's got it's not masked in anything. It's not marinated. You know, it's just simply um, we blanch the the belly and then we spike it um and then we rub salt into the skin and then dry it for a couple of days right and then is that uncovered uncovered yeah so we actually have fans in our cool rooms to uh help dry out the the picking dark and the pork and then we roast it on a super high heat covered in salt to help create an even layer on the top and then to perfect an amazing kind of crispy crackling on top well that's what everyone wants to know how to do right <laughs> i mean the crackling is like so the gold of exactly so it is you know i think anyone at home who really wants to it's like you can either blanch the pork or steam the pork but then it's all about spiking it like several thousands of times um, and then working in salt into the skin itself and letting it dry out 
and then drawing it out is the key yes yeah big time and then for even that like classic style roast pork and then you can just roast it as you normally would and then in like southeast asian we would actually create a slurry with vinegar and salt and work that into the skin and dry it out as well to just give it a little bit more crunch so that's a that's a pretty nice big piece of pork. Maybe. Yeah. What, so what this sort of is, size pigs are you using? This is Borodale pork. So this comes, um, it's pretty, it's farmed pretty close. Um, I really enjoy the uh, the flavour and the texture of Borodale. Uh, these are these are pretty big. Uh, I think they're like one fifty to two hundred kg. Um, you know, when they're all broken down. So yeah, it's a uh, it's really great. We use the same um, pork neck. Uh, for our chasu, yeah, no. so this is a little bit more um, involved preparation. It's a, a few days, um, so we cure it first, mainly in salt and sugar and uh, five spice. Um, that goes for kind of a couple of hours. We cure it, and then we take it out of the cure, give it a rinse, and then we marinate it in that iridescent red that you would always see in the classic Chinese barbecue uh, where the red comes from the fermented bean curd and there's rose wine in there, hoisin um, and some uh, tobinyan, some bean paste and then we let that cure, uh, like marinate and cure for another kind of two to three days and then give it a rinse and then then, uh, roast it on kind of 160 for kind of 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes and just keep basting it in honey in a honey maltose and then it's kind of all ready for ready for service. And so then, how long are you hanging it up here for? Um, this will kind of do, we'll get it to kind of almost where we want and it will be, it, it cooks quite quickly due to the cure and the marinade, but then we're just kind of like alternating it in the oven, in and out of the oven, glazing it till it's ready to serve. So we'll get it to kind of like 95% of where we want to serve it and yep. then to water we'll reflash it and reglaze it and reserve it and then serve it kind of with a nice kind of roasted echelot garlic chili five spice kind of sauce as well beautiful why that cut why is it the neck uh the neck's like the neck i think is you know it's one of the most kind of underutilized cuts in pork i think it's just so amazing that the different muscle and fat kind of groups within the neck just make it perfect for chasu where it's you know, it's tender, it's kind of chunky, and, and, and this mix of fat and, and different kind of lean parts of the neck, it's, like, so good. And that's it's my favorite cut for curry as well, for sure. Like, an awesome, like, green curry or even, like, nice. a, a Indian-style curry. Yeah, yeah, the pork neck, you just cook it to that, like, perfect kind of perfection of just kind of over but not too far, and it's just, like, melt in the mouth. Yeah, it's really good. Now, chasu is amazing, but I think, you know, we've skipped past. I'm wanting to know a secret to getting the crackling <laughs> right on this pork, <laughs> roast pork belly. That's the question on everyone's lips, isn't yeah. it? Always. That's like probably a number one question kind of being asked for. So you probably don't want to give away your secrets, but is there, is no, there something, that you, something that's uh, vital? Um, I think really, yeah, I think kind of that that two stage cooking I think is really important. I know it's really difficult when people try and perfect a crackling at home just from kind of a, a pork belly that they're ever gonna roll or yeah. or just roast straight up where you're just using hundred percent kind of dry heat. Um, I think that kind of Asian style of either steaming or blanching before with the spike method yeah. and working in salt to that skin. And like, it's really like, it's not just your kind of, you know, massaging in a bit. Yeah. You really, you really have to work it in almost till you, be- it becomes kind of slimy from working wow. the salt okay. into the fat and then it creating almost like a, like a sludge almost and then, and then drying it out. And then if you roast it like that, just as you would on kind of like 220, um, you know, I just to start with 220. Yeah, and then you can then drop it down drop to it like down. 180, 160, and then to kind of achieve that perfect like. But it's nice with kind of sometimes when you do it just straight dry heat, it's 
crunchy but almost too crunchy yeah where if you do the kind of double cook with the spiking it's crunchy but like uh honeycomb almost like a like yeah like glass it. yeah <laughs> 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 We're gonna have to eat some now, right? <laughs> I'm a bit of a sucker for for uh, for crackling as well. Yeah. Well, I I often cook pork for big groups just because I want to eat as much crackling yeah. as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to use your tips. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess the next thing is is um, can can we try some of this? Yeah. Yeah. So let's just check here, this guys. Yeah. So you can see this is like. As part of the process. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, you get with that salt, you get a really nice even coat. And I think what's nice about and it is you haven't scored it. You know, no. like traditionally, like, you know, where you see a lot of people scoring the pork too. Yeah, and you kind of ruin that, um, ruining that kind of it's perfect. It's like glassy, isn't it? Even. So this you can see, if we just continued to roast it, it would all you'd, it'd dry up all just... Just like this part here, so it's still got a little, little ways to go on the top, but you can see it's starting to, to come in, and as it cools, it'll crunch up as well. Is that also what happens when yeah. it cools? The cr that's yeah, when the crunch well, comes along. Yeah, kind of. It's ex uh, you know, just like any kind of cooking with any fat or any oil, as the oil cools and solidifies yeah look at that so how do you serve this just like so we'll just do it in straight cubes and just with some um, English mustard and hoisin English and it's mustard just that, yeah <laughs> from you know it's from the that's why you know Cantonese is quite such a such a cool <laughs> kind of cuisine as well because it's you know like all great cuisine it's influenced by different you know like uh, you know kind of Multicultural backgrounds and totally. invasions, when trade and <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you know, normally it's kind of, you know, like a bit of suspect background. But yeah, the, when the uh, in Hong Kong with with the colonial, uh, you know, migration there, and that's a kind of this beautiful building as well. We're standing in Stanley, that great old colonial style. Totally, you know, it was like it was meant to be a, a Cantonese restaurant. You, know? you could you could be anywhere but Brisbane, actually. It's like you amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's like unbelievable. Should we try some? Yeah, so try this kind of corner bit. It'll be... I might have to loosen my belt buckle, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lucky it's in all the way in Brisbane, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so although you can get cheap flights these days, <laughs> I know, <Yeah. laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's unreal. So you do also a, a classic suburban Australian dish. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Sweet and sour pork. Even in even in Mullumbimby, we had a you know we had a Far East local Chinese restaurant, and um, yeah, like like what I was talking about, you know, just finding this really great kind of really great produce, really awesome suppliers. And then, you know, not not having to do a modern twist or not having to do fusion, you know, we can just do these really great classic dishes that have been around for so long that everyone's familiar with, though just do the best version anyone's ever had. And that's always been a kind of a, a challenge to me. You know, I did it when I went to the States, you know, in the top of the restaurant. I wanted to do this kind of cool street food snack, you know, like with the cocktails and things. But yeah. being in West Hollywood, it it wasn't the, you know, people didn't gravitate to it as you would, you know, somewhere yeah. in, you know, Sydney or Melbourne. or. But I didn't, you know, you know, like kick up a stink and be be angry and go oh they don't know what they're talking about I said well what, what do they eat so I just did a bit of a kind of you know reconnaissance around and seeing and people were eating you know like one thing I always saw was like a chicken sandwich you know and I was like okay I'll just make the best fucking chicken sandwich <laughs> that these guys have ever had so we brine the chicken in like an aromatic brine of Szechuan and star anise cassia bark and get an awesome like gluten free like super amazing crust that say crunchy for days and a spicy mayo and things and and you know in the first weekend I think we sold like 
300 of them, you know? And it's just like, it's just, I just love that about cooking. It's like giving the customers what they want, but just giving them the best possible one they've ever had. And you don't have to change your style or, or kind of sell out as they would. It's like, no, you just take it as a challenge and be like, all right, you suckers want to eat chicken sandwich? All right, try this, you know? And then people would, it became like a cult. Yeah, people were coming for the chicken sandwich to eat the chicken sandwich, you know? So, and that's kind of like what we've tried to create with, you know, we've got Mongolian lamb ribs and sweet and sour pork and Kung Pao chicken uh, and just doing these really cool classic dishes, but with great produce. Well, that, that sweet and sour pork, when, when I ate here a couple of months ago, like that reminded me of my youth <laughs> and it didn't feel any different but it just <laughs> ate a lot better <laughs> it ate like my um fond memories rather than what i was actually eating I think. but um can you run us through that process because it was it's actually quite light yeah you know and um you enjoy like good pieces of pork in yeah there as yeah well. like it's not just all batter no no you know, absolutely and, so and, um and it's just like capsicum and, and pineapple right? capsicum and pineapple and yeah. some white onion you know <laughs> classic so, yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the batter was, you know, the, we really worked on that for a few weeks of trying rice flour, tapioca starch, glutinous rice flour, corn starch, potato starch, kuzu starch, you know, just like all these different, because, you know, it always, it's just about these different kind of variations or techniques or kind of ratios. And I literally, after about three weeks, we finally kind of were just sold on a, like a, a cornstarch batter. It, it kind of, it, it fried the best, but then stayed super fluffy and light. Yeah. But then it absorbed the sauce, but didn't go soggy. Yeah. So it was just, it was like a, a certain kind of method um, to that and just using really good, again, really good quality pork neck, cooking a, an awesome kind of sweet and sour that we kind of, cook over a long period of time to infuse a lot of the capsicum mm. and pineapple into the sauce itself along with then the kind of the chunks in the in the in the stir fry itself so well and that's one of the beauties of it it's like it's rich with the sauce but it's not a big gluggy sauce because no. it's all caught on the yeah, pieces yeah yeah yeah, like yeah yeah so and it's kind of like oh sweet and sour so that's a that's an easy one tick it off but it was actually one of the more involved <laughs> dishes that really kind of tested us to create this kind of uh, awesome version of it. Yeah, so it's kind of, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it's kind of like, like, you know, lots of Asian cooking. The simple dishes are the ones you can really mess up, you know, rather than the complex ones with all the different pastes and stir fries and marinades. They're the ones that you can kind of tweak a lot and, and, and perfect where it's those ones that just have, two or three ingredients that they're, they're really transparent and if you mess one of those processes up or one of the ingredients it's it's very easy to kind of see well uh louis i'm gonna have a <laughs> another piece of this <laughs> but um mate it's been unreal thanks for letting us be in your kitchen oh, of course no it's great and glad um, to share it i think uh that uh, crackling's calling me so. <laughs> thanks mate you're welcome thank you this is the crackling a deep in the weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.